Hello, dear friends. We are sincerely glad to greet you again. Today we are going to talk with the esteemed Igor Mihalovich Danilov. Greetings. Igor Mihalovich, all of us, all our viewers, are really deeply touched by the previous video and that revelation before us, before all our friends, before all Alatra TV viewers. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. You know, Igor Mihalovich, what is very important is that when people have to experience something similar in their lives, as a rule, it embitters their hearts and they even lose faith in people. But huge thanks to you for showing a different example, that it is possible and necessary to live differently. And many thanks to you for this deep compassion for people, for love for our neighbors. You know, there is a great desire. And the previous video encourages us all very much to do everything possible to build the creative society, a world where not a single person would have to experience such events, a world where everyone would be free, free from fear, so that they would not be afraid of those shadows. The video itself was truly tough, and it evoked various feelings. You know, there was both pain and, as they say, laughter through tears, along with perplexity and failure to understand how can it be that we live in such an unjust world, and pain about what people have to face, including the participants of the Creative Society project, and understanding of the schemes, the nefarious schemes that have been used against us, ordinary and honest people, for millennia by this, let's say, sect, the radical extremist sect of the keepers. Also, Igor Mihalovich, after the previous video, many people all over the world expressed their public support in their social networks for the participant of the Creative Society project who had suffered from this lawlessness. Thus, this story has received wide publicity. And, you know, I'm sincerely pleased that there are people who realize that there is no such thing as a stranger's misfortune, and that there are true friends who express such open support and do everything possible to shed light under these dark, shadowy sides. This is wonderful. And I want to thank all the people, all our friends, who showed concern for the faith of our participant, for the volunteer, a volunteer like all of us, who got into an unpleasant situation just because someone wants to rule the world. In fact, by defending our friend, we protect ourselves. When our constitutional, our human rights are violated, if we remain indifferent, we should know that if today our friends or our neighbors' rights have been violated, then tomorrow our rights will be violated. If today the court of justice… What court of justice? Is that a court of justice? How can you call it a court of justice when everything is violated as… just as it was violated millennia ago, when under the same charge, the same charge under which Jesus Christ was executed, they start to execute innocent people. Yes, it would seem that there is a difference. In that case, it was Jesus Christ who brought the truth here. He was crucified, he was destroyed, he was feared. But today, an ordinary citizen who sincerely wants to improve the life of every, I emphasize, every person in this world, including those who abused her, Literally, a group of criminals, a gang, who have colluded in a criminal conspiracy and violating the Constitution, violating all conceivable rights that should be natural to every human being, they convicted this person only to introduce the phrase that the Creative Society is a religious movement. That's what they want. And they don't care about people's fates, they don't care whom they hurt, they don't care about anything that is not related to their own prosperity. This is insane. This is… You know, frankly speaking, I don't like to insult people. And it's a wrong thing to do, because the things that people are doing, even these people whom I call the group of criminals, and they are indeed a group of criminals, because, excuse me, the law enforcement agencies have colluded with representatives of the Church. But we know why. We know what they want and who is really behind them. And that's what people are explaining now. So, when the judge, the one who should stand for the interests of the people, for the Constitution and for the rights of every citizen, takes the side of those who lobby for their interests on a world scale. It would seem it's a province, it's not a big thing. 
no friends. There is no trifle anywhere, especially when it comes to our legal rights, when it comes to our true freedoms. You know, in fact, now one might say that we made a mountain out of a molehill about this situation, just because a local diocese of some church, it's not some church, it's a huge organization that is within that church and has convinced those very church representatives that they must be the one and only monopoly for the whole country. Just like we said in the previous video, in order to rule in this country and rule in other countries, that's what the problem is, they are fighting for power. Well, it is said that we made a big deal out of it, and that, in fact, there is nothing like that. However, if there is nothing like that, then why? While convicting in one case, which is unacceptable, either from the moral point of view or from the legal point of view, and those who made this up, on the contrary, they should now be on trial. But they introduce and push the decision through the court. The next step will be extremism. And look how they have inflated this thing in many countries. I mean extremism. And they are throwing people in jail in droves. But who was fighting extremism? Let's look back into history. Who actually invented this concept of division? And who was the first to fight heresy and religious untruth? Did Christ do it? No, friends. The Antichrist did. And up till now, and especially today, all this serves as a tool that can remove the unwanted people, and the truth disappears, our rights disappear, and therefore the future disappears. People suffer for no reason. Indeed, just because they want to make the world a better place and to make even those who punish them happy. If we look at it from the other side, because of this fly, which is presented to us as something scary, what this volunteer has allegedly done, dreaming of a better life, which every person on this planet deserves, because of this fly, we do not see the elephant that rules this world. Those architects of this world, who have killed billions of people and who want to reduce our entire humanity of more than 8 billion to 500 million, a number that is convenient to them, well, a billion at the most, because they can easily manipulate that number, simply control, and keep them on the leash. You know, like a riding horse or like a donkey on which they ride to their paradise, invented by them. However, those people we are talking about, the so-called keepers, the architects of this world, have made a mistake. They have made a mistake about time and they have made a mistake about their dreams. For 2,000 years they've been killing truly holy people. They killed and destroyed those who strived for freedom. They've been shutting and are still shutting our mouths to this day, enacting and toughening laws over us, manipulating the Constitution and all our rights. They seek absolute rule, but they've made a mistake. They've made a mistake because this world is our home and our world. Their world was destroyed 12,000 years ago. And those who look at history with an open mind will see where the roots come from, what this organization is, and that it really exists. I think we should talk about them a little bit, because throughout history they acted in such a way that they always described heroes, those whom they put in power and whom they easily manipulated and controlled. As a rule, like in the story of that very Constantine, they took people who were easily manipulated, they took those who were feeble-minded, yet highly prideful and easily controllable, and whose thirst for power and money was absolutely insatiable. And behind them, like shadows, there were those representatives of this organization, 
of the keepers, or the great architects as they were known in the world. They created many different organizations, whom people later accused of all kinds of evil things possible, things that were actually done by the architects. They introduced symbols and signs so that we could see them. Why? Because, in fact, there have always been rumors about them, and everyone suspected that there is some kind of a force. But it was always said that it was an institution of power and an institution of business. Attention was always diverted from them, and people blamed anyone but them. Yet they have always been there. They wrote history and presented those people controlled and manipulated by them as the world's greatest minds. And we know them, Alexander of Macedon. You know, when you know the truth, it becomes funny. When an ordinary man, who was afraid of his own shadow, who was afraid of everything, but he was inspired by his teacher, who in his turn didn't belong to and had nothing to do with this secret destructive sect that ruled the world already at that time, yet he was merely a friend of the One, who was a true representative of the architects of this world. And through him, through this very teacher of the greatest of the conquerors of this world, that architect easily manipulated the ruler himself, the ordinary man. That's why the latter won wars, that's why he was such a hero. But when he got a little bit carried away, and he started to infringe upon the interests of the very organization of the keepers, he was simply eliminated, as many other people, as the keepers eliminated those who were supposed to make this world much better, brighter, more beautiful, those who were supposed to make our lives beautiful, wonderful and dignified, indeed, to make us a dignified and united civilization, so that we could live the way befitting a human being. This world, which was supposed to belong to us, they have made it a hostage. They've made the whole world and each of us a hostage to their desires. All they dream of is El's return. All they dream of is to bring their immortals back to life, whom only El can bring back. Only El controlled their lives, for He is a God to them. Just look how it all fits into an overall picture when you know the truth. And now many people know it. But what does this indicate? This indicates that the world will change. Maybe it will. But this world can change only when we have enough inner fire, inner light to illuminate this world. You know, I'll give you a simple example. If there are many of us in a room, the room is completely dark and we only light one candle, then each of us creates a lot of shadows. And in these shadows there are those whom we call the keepers or the architects. But if we light as many candles as there are of us and we place them around us, yes, we will cast shadows, but those shadows will be transparent and we will see everything in the bright light and it won't be possible to hide in those shadows. If we use our power for the good of this world, the world will change. And our power is in our word. There is nothing more powerful than a word. We cannot use our power in some explicit actions that are destructive or directed towards illegal and distorted actions. Why? Because it is us who will suffer, because we are human beings. That's why we say that each of us, in this consumerist format, should be a patriot of his country first and foremost and protect the interests of his country. Any stability, even a bad one, is still stability, and it is better than instability. And we know this. We've seen it in history and experienced it many times. We've experienced different revolutions, after which we people lived wars. We people have been deprived of our natural rights after these revolutions. And every destructive event that these sectarians have committed with our hands, that event has deprived us of our rights and freedoms. Lately we see how these very keepers have become active all over the world. That's why the climate Cerberus is in this world. They dreamed and were already one step away from an absolute rule and the return of El. But 
El will never return to this world. And there will never be an absolute rule in this world again. That's why the Cerberus is here. And now all of us, all of humanity, are separated and divided into fragments by these architects. All of us, like a broken mirror, reflecting this truth and these shadows, we will all experience the same fate. And regardless of what it is, we will do it together. But we, like broken fragments of a mirror, reflect light. And many of us are already able to radiate light. And that says a lot. If we understand the importance and the value of our light in this world, which is our aspiration for a normal human life, for our unification, for the unification of all humanity, if we understand that we can come forward as one united humanity against the Cerberus, as a free humanity, with burning fire inside, we will create such a light, in which the light of the Cerberus will dissolve, and it won't be a threat to us, and won't be able to do anything to us. But if we remain as we are, then the destiny of each and every one of us will be the same as those events that are taking place now predict. I'll put it simply, those whom we call the Keepers have created a lot of temples in this world in the hope of controlling our minds and our hearts. But now their actions are so destructive that if we don't find freedom within ourselves, don't find God within ourselves, and don't find an aspiration for life, because precisely God gives us an aspiration for life, the devil gives us the desire for envy, for hatred and for division. So if we don't find God within ourselves, and if we don't find the strength within ourselves to fulfill what Jesus Christ wanted, what the best of men, the Prophet Muhammad, wanted, and if we don't unite, there will remain neither us nor temples in this world. Let's look at Mars. We showed and told that there was life on it. And here, delving a bit into the past, we can say with certainty, even if there is a temple of some kind left, perhaps some stone and solid temple, there will be no visitors in it. And it makes no sense for them, for those who now work for this soulless organization, to change our lives for the worse. But we see their destructive activities everywhere around us. We see or rather we look at this, but sometimes we do not notice how they exert influence nor why. Let me explain by a simple example, so that it doesn't seem like science fiction. They do not come to the far front themselves, as I already said. They use their people, you know, to play second, third or even fifth fiddle. We look at history, we see the heroes, those pawns they played, but we don't see them. Why? Because the Keepers don't describe them, seemingly. But it isn't so, friends. They always write for their circle and put the names of their heroes into history. But as a rule, they are always like that very Gamaliel, that scriptwriter of the destruction of Jesus Christ, and that scriptwriter who, through his disciples, turned Jesus' teaching into what we have now, the very opposite of what Jesus Christ taught. Whereas Gamaliel's name is just between the lines and not the first or the last one. But those who know where to look will always see them, and will always see them in history and in the lives of those who manipulate our consciousness. Everything is tried and easy, in fact. Let me give you an example of how it is done and what it means that they are the architects of this world. Everything is very simple. For instance, my friend, you're building a house. This is a simple example, and I think it will be clear to many people. You've decided to save money and build the house faster. 
So you've hired builders. A foreman says, let us build you a simple, fast, high-quality house. We will do everything well. You've agreed with him on a project. And the house is being built. And here a neighbor passes by, who says, listen, such a beautiful house, such a great job, but your entrance is simple, it is unshaped. If it were in the form of an arch, just imagine, an arched entrance is much stronger than a usual N-shape. Your house would be preserved for your grandchildren. Imagine, your grandchildren would be living in your house. You would build it not just for your children, but for your grandchildren. And this house would stand out among all the others in the village. There are no houses in our street or in the neighboring streets with such a complex architecture, with such an arched doorway. All your neighbors have N-shaped ordinary doorways. That would be cool. Well, I see you're not up for it. How are you doing in general? And he starts talking about something else. You come home and think, yes, it will take a bit longer, it will increase the cost, but it will be the only such house on our street and neighboring streets. You invite the foreman and tell him, look, I've changed my mind, let's make some changes to our project. Let's make an arch the doorway. It will look more expensive and more beautiful. It will be the centerpiece of my house and it will serve my grandchildren because of its more durable construction. The foreman answers, well, it will prolong the construction, it will increase the cost. Do you really need it? Everyone has houses like yours. Why do you need it? But you say, well, those are their houses, while this one is mine. And you agree, not knowing, that a little bit earlier, that friend and neighbor of yours who suggested to you the idea of this arched doorway talked to that foreman, and the latter casually told him, the house is good, and we are building well, but the owner did a stupid thing. He decided to make an N-shaped doorway, saving literally pennies and a couple of extra days. But if he had made an arched doorway, this house would stand out and serve him longer. But who would recommend it to him? I cannot tell him about it, for he will say, it means, you just want to make money on me. I cannot actually earn extra money on my client, given that we've agreed on the project. And again, he doesn't know anything about architecture. If a specialist told him, perhaps he would listen to him. Well, in general, the house is solid. And the foreman immediately starts telling this friend and neighbor of yours that his house is beautiful, and he saw it, who built it? He begins to ask simple questions and evoke pridefulness in him. And the man, excited by the foreman's words, having already forgotten that it was this foreman who recommended this doorway to him, Upon seeing his neighbor, gives him advice on how to build the house correctly, as a person who had built a beautiful house. After all, he's the creator. He created a house for himself, and he shares his experience as the greatest of architects on how his neighbor should build correctly. Tell me, don't we encounter such situations? We do encounter, but do not notice. Some people say there are overton windows. Yes, these are well-described psychological techniques thanks to which any stupidity becomes our reality, and sometimes even the law. But who is behind it all, behind those overton windows? In fact, everything is banal and visible. The architects do not act straightforward and stupid like that. They stay behind those who created these windows, playing the fifth fiddle, or even more remote roles. But they always remain in history, and if you want to, you can find any information, even on the example which we considered, thanks to which we have seen how that scheme works, according to the exact same scenario, for illegal missionary activity, speaking in modern terms, for which Jesus Christ was executed in the same way as innocent people are being executed nowadays in a Russian province. Thank you, friends, for not being indifferent for understanding that today, by punishing and depriving one person of constitutional rights, tomorrow they will deprive the entire country and then the whole world. We understand this and we see this. But do we see that elephant 
behind this event, behind what seems to be a fly. Sometimes we do not see simple things. That's the way our consciousness works. And those who manipulate it know perfectly well how our consciousness works. They know perfectly well how to instill a thought in someone, so that the entire world would change afterwards. They know perfectly well how to bring to power the one they want. When considering the same example in that province, we clearly saw how people whom they manipulated and who were convenient to them were appointed to the supreme government body. But how many such provinces are there, not only in that country, but all over the world? Provinces where the futures of the countries are created. Those provinces which we don't pay attention to, but exactly from there, as from the shadows, that trouble creeps out, which then ruins countries from the provinces where evil is reborn, the provinces from where shadows actually creep out. However, if there are people who did not succumb to them, then, by playing with our consciousness just as skillfully, these manipulators would accuse them of extremism, this terrible word, which in fact means division. And those who divide us, manipulate by what they do themselves. Meanwhile, we see it, but don't understand it. Not understanding, we keep silent. We don't understand that this is our life, this is our destiny. Those rights of which we've been deprived today and which we have failed to get back will be taken away from our children tomorrow. Today, we suffer. Tomorrow, our children will suffer. And the day after tomorrow, our world will disappear. It will disappear just because today we haven't found the strength to defend the right to live, the constitutional rights and natural freedoms of another person, an ordinary person just like us. And how many such seemingly trivial cases are there? Trivial for whom? For someone who has elevated himself to heaven, for someone who has ceased to consider himself a human, who has exalted himself to celestials, while in fact he is just a piece, an ordinary piece on a chessboard, played by someone who is in the shadows, and whom sometimes this piece doesn't even know. Yet the one who plays this person is known to a boyfriend. Just note, a boyfriend of his wife's friend. It would seem, what kind of connection can there be? Well, the same as with that very neighbor who suggested how to properly make an arch. You cannot find the guilty. But the bottom line is that this fly kills elephants. This is true, and that's what our world is filled with. But can we change the situation? Yes, friends, we can change everything. We can build the creative society where there will be no money and there will be no power. Thus, every action against us will disappear. And any action can only be aimed at improving our lives. Just look, please, don't take offense, friends. I will call things by their proper names. After all, in many aspects, for many years, the Jewish people have been accused of being the ones who manipulate us. Yes, they are the smartest people, and very often they were advisors to kings and many others, those who ruled our world. As a rule, Jews ascend to high positions in various organizations, and it would seem that they are to blame for everything, it would seem. But if we look at the root, of this entire world, we often see completely different people behind them. And the wise consciousness of the Jews, so to say, didn't see simple manipulations and didn't see how even they themselves were manipulated. However, these people who evoked envy and sometimes even hatred among representatives of many other nationalities, can serve the entire humanity and bring benefit in the creative society. And all our hatred towards each other and all the divisions that were artificially and skillfully imposed on us by the architects of this world, while it was being built the way it is now, it will all disappear, we will have nothing to divide. Again, let's take the topic of nationalism.
the topic seems to be acute. And it caused the emergence of Nazism and many other bad things. But can we accuse anyone of nationalism when each of us in any country is such? It would seem that's impossible. Well, how come it's impossible? Let's consider a simple example. Let's take the bulwark of democracy, as it is called across the world, America. It is definitely impossible there. There. Well, what nationalism can there be? when there is a huge number of people from all over the world of different nationalities and different religions. Why? Because until recent times, laws aimed at people's freedoms have been working there, and their remnants are still working. Therefore, there are still so many freedoms left compared to other countries. However, is there nationalism there, which unites everyone into one nation? When everyone says, America above all, America is paramount. What is this? And this is normal nationalism. They are standing up for their country, for patriotism. But what is patriotism? Here's the answer for you. It is the answer to the question, will there be nationalism in the creative society? I'll put it this way, in the creative society it won't exist. Well, during the transition period that all of us will enter as we are now, of course there will be nationalism. And there will be an opportunity to prove the superiority of one nation over another by their deeds, not by killing, not by exterminating their own kind, but on the contrary, by serving the entire humanity. And if some nation is able to improve the life of every citizen, I will easily say, thank you, and will admit that they are better united, they are smarter, and they have improved my life. Is that bad? It's good, especially bearing in mind that when we enter the creative society, we will become one united family, one united civilization. Yes, each of us will have our own countries, they won't disappear anywhere. We will have our customs and traditions, those that do not separate us. But we won't have money, and we won't have power, which means that we won't have enmity. Hence, shadows will disappear in our world. Those deep shadows were like cockroaches, those who are actually the architects of our thoughts and our lives are hiding. Those who violate our constitutional and international rights, and even any conceivable elementary rights of our conscience and humaneness, those who force us to kill each other, those who force us to desire things, that we don't really need. Look how simple this is. And it is indeed simple. But it is simple only when we want to live. It is simple only when we, as one humanity, start living and defending our rights. After all, by defending our friend, we defend ourselves, we defend our children, we defend our countries, and we defend our constitutions. We defend them against that field, that human, vile essence, which destroys everything. And when we ensure that those who should protect our rights will not sit in the same bathhouse with those who usurp these rights and manipulate us, then, friends, we will be one step closer to the Truth. When we call things by their proper names and are not shy about anything, then the world will change. And that's easy. In the previous video, I told you about my life. And maybe more than I should have told, I don't know. But I can be excused. I am a man who survived two concussions not so long ago. And to be honest, it took me a month to learn to stand on two feet again without wobbling. Being a man, as one of those fellows put it, with a marked consciousness. I have the right to call things by their proper names, just like any normal person even one who didn't have a concussion. You see how we are fond of stigmatizing, belittling and insulting someone. Why? To belittle a person's value. What's the point? Will we exalt ourselves that way, as this representative of the Church, called all the people of Alatra, mentally deranged, exalting himself to the heights of an expert, even in the fields of psychiatry and psychology. In his opinion, only deranged people can depart from the Antichrist. 
and come to Christ in this darkened world that has one foot in the grave. This is funny. It is funny when you know the truth and when you see the light at the end of this tunnel. But when he is in such a state, when he, as a human, is torn apart by his desire and aspiration to exalt himself above us, when he, as an allegedly great author of great books, doesn't get worldwide recognition, meanwhile his brain, pardon me, works far too actively because too many thoughts are coming to him, and it draws for him many forms, those fantastic forms which he has seen around him. When he saw how people prostrated themselves in front of their Metropolitan Bishop, kissing his hands, do you think he doesn't want that kind of life? He does. Doesn't he want greatness? He does. And this is precisely what makes him create various illegal combinations in order to gain favor with the Metropolitan Bishop, in order to make a name for himself. And the demon inside elevates him above people, and he already begins to openly manipulate our opinions and bring those who are convenient to him into authority over us. Look, an ordinary man, an ordinary teacher of history, yet he manipulates the country, he makes decisions in his head and not by his own initiative regarding what to say about the president elected by the whole nation and voted for by a huge part of the country, yet this man's opinion is much higher. And by voicing his discontent, he exalts himself about the rest. Everyone else was stupid and made the wrong choice, only he knows whom to vote for. And only he in his head is capable of making the right decisions for the whole country and for the whole world. Look how simple this is. A simple question. Who is actually behind him? Who? fuels him from within, and who makes him what he is now. Everything is very simple. Who is sacrificing this pawn in their game? That's the answer. Everything is very simple in this world. But what should our world be like? This is what Jesus Christ told us, whom people like this fellow were supposed to serve, since he is the head of missionary activities along with his patriarchs. This world was supposed to be the way the best of men, the Prophet Muhammad, bequeathed to us. Let's recall an episode from history that truly illustrates the greatness of the Prophet and the fact that to this day the Prophet Muhammad remains the best of men. Let's recall the story of the Well of Rumah, after all, it perfectly demonstrates the Prophet's greatness. For those who don't know, I'll briefly recount the story. There was a well in a place where water was scarce. It belonged to a Jew who sold this water and whose family lived off this income. However, there was a man who decided to buy out this well and share the water with the Prophet's Ummah. The Prophet said, if you buy out the well, there is an express condition that you should give it to the Ummah. And once you give it to the Ummah, you, like everyone else, will stand in line for water, without any benefits for buying out this well. Only then we as the Ummah will accept this gift from you. Look how simple it is. However, some people succumb to megalomania and pridefulness. These are the tools the architects play on, and which they easily manipulate. Let's say, our human weaknesses strive to take water without waiting one's turn, to get what doesn't belong to us, to take from people what belongs to them, including their rights and often their lives. Look how simple it is how everything is happening openly before our eyes. And just like the enormous crowd of people who watched the execution of the Son of God stood still and remained silent, so do we, a huge number of people, stand still and remain silent when our friends are executed, while we are well aware that we are next. 
but fear. Exactly fear for our lives, the fear of these shadows, or rather of those who hide in these shadows, whom we have never seen. Yet this fear is intensified by those whom we have never seen. And we are silent. If we are silent, when someone is being punished, we must realize that we will be punished next. Everything is simple. However, the world we live in, the world where a small group of people pursued absolute domination, who wanted to take this world, our world, and make it their own, is approaching a point, a point at which all of us must make a choice, at which we will share the same fate, in any case, and we will be united anyway, but we'll be united by a common tragedy, or, on the contrary, by something that will give us a great prospect, by the fact that the world that the Prophets dreamed of will come. And then, those who seek power over us won't be present in it, because there will be no power. We are capable of changing our world for the better, but only when we genuinely love each other, when we respect each other, and understand the full value of our lives, when we understand that we are human beings, when we realize that we can be united and everything that was dividing us is nonsense imposed on us. And then we can follow the example of the best people of this world. After all, we can take the best. We always seek to imitate, and we always imitate someone. So why don't we start imitating others, not those who changed history, not those who substituted the truth? We shouldn't seek to dominate each other. We don't need that. Instead, we should direct our aspirations towards actually changing this world, towards removing evil from it, removing hunger and thirst from it, towards providing enough food and water to all people and making everyone in this world feel protected and happy. Can you imagine? We can do that. It depends on each of us what we choose and whether we will be able to implement what our Prophets wanted to implement. It is easy, but it is only easy when each of us understands that within each of us there is power and that light which can erase all shadows. We can do it, friends, but only when we are together, only when we don't betray our friends, when we are united as one family, because we will become one family anyway, whether we want it or not. And the only question is, where our family will go, in what direction, and when. Everything is simple. Igor Mihalovich, thank you very much. I certainly wish we would all come together and unite as a whole world. And many people were deeply touched by your words from the previous video. It is very painful that behind you, behind your shoulders, there is merely a white wall. I would very much like the whole Ummah to be behind your shoulders, as well as Christians and Judeans, so that all of us, as the entire world, would be united in one family. And here's a question, why should I be behind my shoulders? I would rather be behind your shoulders, behind a united Ummah, behind a united Christianity, behind a united world, because I am the same human being as you. Again, in the previous video, we raised a question about Imam Mahdi, about the Comforter, even about the Mashiach. But who are they? Are they different people? No. It's not even one person. This is a sign of the time, of that time which all of us are in right now, friends. It is really a sign of the time. The Mashiach, the Comforter, and Imam Mahdi lives in everyone if we accept Him. This is that ray of light 
which gives hope to all of humanity. And if we nurture this light within ourselves, if we become humans, if we strive for a common goal, whereas the common goal at this stage is the survival of all humanity, if we strive to build a creative society, which is nothing but the highest value, this creative society which we are talking about is what our saints have proclaimed to us. They are the ones who said that Imam Mahdi would come to us, the Comforter would come to us, but he would come into the soul of everyone. And if we revive him in ourselves, if we become a part of this world, excuse me, not a slave of this world, but a part of this world, then Mahdi, the Comforter and the Mashiach will be in each of us. That is the banner of this world. If we lift up the One who is called by many names, if we lift Him up as a banner over all humankind, then what the Prophets promised us will come true. Thousands of years, but I'll correct it and say billions of years for all humankind. It's not that I'll be correcting them, they were the Prophets. And when they said thousands, or a thousand years of the Golden Age, they were just talking about the huge and infinite number of years. But there is no such thing as infinity in a finite world. Therefore, friends, I cannot promise you eternity unless you yourselves enter it. But in this world, we know very well that we as humanity will have billions of years ahead of us, and our descendants will be proud of us. And this pride is worth a lot. As for all our pridefulness, which we use to be manipulated, excuse me, but that's how it is. In fact, we all suffer because of pridefulness. Yes, all manipulations over us are built on pridefulness, and we accept this. It is instilled in us that we are kind of good, we are strong, we are heroes. And since we are heroes, we should go and kill somebody. They manipulate us based on pridefulness, forcing us, excuse me, to betray our friends. And by and large, sometimes they even force us to stab our friends in the back, literally out of pridefulness, by manipulating our opinion, desire and aspiration. But all of this is perceived from strangers and outsiders only because we live based on this pridefulness and are guided by it. Yet there is a lot we can change. It's true, friends, we can turn our bile low and in human pridefulness around and lift it up to the heavens. Our common human pridefulness and change it from serving Satan to serving God. And this pridefulness of ours, that power which makes us serve Satan, can help us serve God, and thus all of humanity. I will repeat the words I said. Remember it, my friends. If we, each of us as human beings, live for ourselves, it means we serve Satan. If there is only us and our family for us, and our family is only there to admire and support us, to look upon us as God. We have dug our own grave, we have bought a place in hell. But if we live as a human being for humanity, if each of us cares for all of humanity, and that is our main goal, to serve all of humanity, then the gates of Paradise open before us, and we are able to change this world. But we are able to change it only when there are many of us, when we create a single egregore that is directed towards the best side of this world, towards God, towards the future of all humanity. Then we can change a lot. I'll give a simple example for you to understand. Many people will say, how can I, an ordinary person, serve the whole of humanity if I only lay asphalt, for instance? I'll tell you, my friend, how you can save both your grandchild and the future of all humankind by laying asphalt. 
We do not know how our actions will affect the future. A simple example, when we are laying asphalt, we can, out of laziness, slightly change what we had to do. We can put a thinner layer of asphalt, steal a little bit of gravel for our garden or sell it to someone, and in this place a trench will appear. Well, the road is not quite smooth, it's nothing, such a thing happens. But we do not know that when, even in care of our family, we try to sell a truck of gravel planned for this road in order to bring this money home to feed our children or grandchildren, we do not know that years will pass and our grandchild will drive on this road, in this place, and his fate may be different. And we, exactly we, shape this fate. Yet, in care of people, in care of the whole of humanity, and thus of our grandchild, we can deny ourselves the banal, evil desire to do bad to the world and make this road dangerous. And then our grandchild will drive on a smooth road, whereas he can change the world, he can create something that will help the whole of humanity. And then our actions, when we stop ourselves from tried stealing in order to bring an extra sweet to our grandchild, we thus save his life and we serve the whole of humanity. That's how this world is arranged. We don't know how our actions may affect the future, but when our actions are directed towards improving this world, towards serving all humankind, then the world changes as well, at least our destiny changes. Even if we fail to save the entire world, we will at least save ourselves, and that's already worth it. Believe me, friends, our goal, the highest goal of each of us in this world, is life eternal. If we do not understand and do not strive for that, we will serve Satan. And it doesn't matter who we are, what religion we belong to, or whether we are atheists, it doesn't matter. When we support the Antichrist with our actions and deeds, we destroy this world. When we spit on laws and on the rights of other people, when we insult someone or laugh at someone, we do not elevate ourselves, we bury ourselves and our future. This is simple. The entire world is much simpler than they lied to us. Those ones lied, who manipulated our opinions, who were decimating us and deprived us of elementary rights which the Lord had given us. Therefore, it depends on us, whose example we follow and how we live. In fact, there are enough examples in this world, examples that we should have followed, and we should have built our lives the way those people were building. However, for some reason we've done it differently. But we've done it so, just because we didn't know that our whole life is a road. And we must walk it with dignity. Everything is simple. Igor Mihalovich, perhaps this is inappropriate, but a lot of our viewers ask a question about the Prophet Muhammad. Why do you call specifically the Prophet Muhammad the best of people? I will answer, friends, because he is indeed the best of people. He is an example for everyone, regardless of religion. And even if you are an atheist, my friend, the life of the Prophet himself, his life is an example for all of us. If we lived the way the Prophet did, if we treated our relatives, friends, acquaintances and strangers the way the Prophet Muhammad did, we would have already been living in this world, like in Paradise, for a long time now. I'll give you a simple example. It's an ordinary story of how the Prophet Muhammad took out garbage every day, even after his Jewish neighbor, who tried to test the Prophet Muhammad, not believing him that he was so good, trying to annoy him and thereby to prove to himself that the Prophet Muhammad was no better than him. So he threw garbage near his door, but the Prophet took that garbage and threw it away, never making a single remark to his neighbor, because he knew who controlled that Jew and why he behaved like that precisely due to the thoughts 
which we, as people, allow in ourselves. After all, our consciousness works this way. When we see and feel the light in someone, our consciousness starts being jealous of that person and sometimes even hating him. It forces us to doubt him. Why? Just so that we don't follow his example, don't change our lives, don't become free, and don't become a candle that destroys the darkness. It is beneficial to our consciousness when we are slaves, when we are manipulated by shadows in our consciousness, when we desire and crave someone else's possessions, when we strive to dominate each other and simply turn this world into what it is nowadays. That's the meaning and the entire game of our consciousness. However, we as people are able to follow an example of the best, the worthiest people in this world, and to change everything in the same way as the neighbor of the best of people, the Prophet Muhammad, eventually changed his life when he realized who the Prophet Muhammad was. However, your own consciousness makes you doubt me, my words and everything that concerns the inner light and such simple, elementary examples. But I can offer you an example, yet I don't recommend you using it as an experiment. But those who doubt and cannot get rid of doubts, at least that the Prophet Muhammad was the best, indeed the best of people. Why? Because the Prophet Muhammad was a human, but he became the worthiest among the worthiest, which is very significant. He was a man who wasn't sent here by Allah. He was a human, but within one lifetime he achieved what no other ordinary people had achieved before him. He became the Prophet Muhammad, the worthiest one. So, you can check and dispel your doubts that he is the best of people. Take your garbage and start putting it near your neighbor's doors every day. And you will see that the Prophet Muhammad was the best of people. But I don't recommend you doing that, because it is unlikely that your neighbors are as highly spiritual and as sincerely loving of Allah as the Prophet Muhammad. I'm sorry for such an example, I don't advise it, don't do that. But if doubts have overcome you so much that you cannot get rid of this demon, then do that, and your neighbors will rid you of this stupidity and these doubts. Everything is simple, so simple in this world, when you get rid of inner filth, when you let the inner light come out, when you live freely and breathe deeply, and it doesn't matter what might be done to your body, a body is dust, it doesn't matter where you are and what kind of sadness your consciousness is trying to draw for you. If you love God with all your heart and you endeavor to radiate light with all your essence, you want to embrace the whole world, to embrace everyone in this world, then you begin to understand that we are all brothers, and we are all one, we are all one big family, and each of us deserves to live, to live as a human. Everything is simple, friends. I will repeat the words of Jesus Christ, which I believe are the most timely and the most appropriate now. May each of you respond to the simple and understandable speech of Christ. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul. And that says it all. Because our life doesn't end with our existence in this mortal body. We are much greater, but we simply don't know about that. And we don't know about it, my friends, just because we are manipulated and the Truth has been hidden from us for millennia by those who wanted to dominate by those who wanted to rule. And this desire was imposed on almost every one of us. Do you know why? I will answer. If you are a pure ear of wheat, carrying life in you, 
among weeds, you will be visible from afar. But if you are a burdock, no one will recognize you among weeds. And that's what those architects always used and keep using to this day. But each of us, by throwing off what was imposed on us, can easily discover all the filth and substitutions and can change a lot of things. Thank you, friends. Thank you for being here. Thank you for not abandoning your friends. Thank you for not giving up. And thank you for striving for the best. Thank you for not being the ones who extinguish the light. Thank you for being those who radiate it. Thanks. Thank you for the example. Thank you for everything. Thank you for everything, friends. Peace be with you and God's love.